history that the genre of um, crime fiction is absent from uh, Arabic literature and maybe also uh, Middle Eastern literature in general. When uh, a certain uh, Pierre Kakia or Kachia, I don't know how it's pronounced, um, in a chapter on unwritten Arabic literature published in his overview of modern Arabic literature in 1990, held that no Arab until then had made a name for himself as a writer of such uh, crime fiction. He was, however, not completely wrong. An echo of his statement may be seen in the fact that two major works on modern Arabic literature, the Encyclopedia of Arabic Literature and the French Histoire de la Littérature Arabe Moderne, um, very quite recent publications, uh, still do not mention crime fiction at all. And this is somehow corroborated by uh, crown witnesses, who tend to be quoted from the Arab world itself. Uh, like the Syrian novelist, not so much known, Ahmed Omar, who, when asked about crime fiction in his own country two years ago, uh, lamentingly confessed that no pure Syrian detective story would come to his mind. In the same vein, uh, a voice from Saudi Arabia holds that crime fiction, or the Riwaya uh, al as he says, uh, will uh, never become one of the popular genres among, uh, of Arabic writing. Uh, and he even warns Arabs to try their hands at the genre because any attempt to do so, to write it so as poorly equipped as we Arabs are, will be an adventure uh, that will keep the readers off uh, the, from reading such kind of fiction or than, rather than attracting them. There have been and uh, still are a number of explanations for the perceived lack of the genre. The old and clearly very orientalist uh, one is that the Islamic world has not gone through a period of enlightenment. Therefore, it has not developed the investigative uh, spirit based on human individuals' uh, rational capacities uh, that is seen to be one of the preconditions uh, of the emergence of the genre in the Western, uh, in Western literatures. Therefore, the Islamic world has no detectives, in literature at least. Another widespread theory is the one repeated recently by the crime fiction writer Matt Rees, saying uh, on a conference in Dubai, that uh, uh, saying that this part of the world knows only corrupt regimes and dictatorships. So for those living under such circumstances, there is no hope of real uh, justice, and therefore any crime fiction would have an aura of uh, futility should it uh, promise a retribution of evil acts. Yet another uh, explanation is forward, uh, put forward by uh, Kamal Abdel Malik on the same conference who said that it is the Arab's traditional uh, predilection for poetry and beautiful language, a completely other kind of argumentation that uh, has been an obstacle so far for developing genuinely, genuinely Arabic uh, crime fiction. But there's also, he says, the social factor, which uh, influences reading habits. And uh, he adds an Arab, if he encounters another Arab in a plane, for instance, sitting there uh, beside him, will feel, f uh, feel compelled to converse with the other part <laughs> part, uh, a seatmate, um, to read a book, uh, as fascinating it may be, would be very impolite. So no chance to read crime fiction, no crime fiction market. Um, on the other side, we have voices uh, like that of Richard Jacquemont, very prominent researcher in, the, uh, in modern Arabic literature. Uh, who say that crime fiction is not uh, absent from uh, Middle Eastern literatures, modern Arabic literature at least. It is there, 
but it has been neglected uh, and disdained as low as a low genre, as low literature because it is mere entertainment. It has become the victim victim of a power play uh, with the literary uh, power play within the literary field, where the intellectuals would not allow the lower genres to come up. Whereas this uh, Richard Jacquemont uh, at least takes up the discussion and uh, tries to counter it, another scholar uh, is a bit enervated. Uh, for Samah Salim, uh, this question whether there is Arabic crime fiction or not, and if not, so why, may be tantalizing, she says, but in the end it's a circular question. Like uh, Samah Salim, uh, many others find it quite tiresome to hear how the Arabic reading world needs its own uh, Janet Ivanovic or its own Martin Luther or its own Margaret Mitchell, as though to achieve legitimate legitimacy, uh, cultures must be dead on mirrors of the Western experience. And this is also the, the argument of Samah Salim. So when this author uh, first saw reference to, to this uh, Emirates Airline uh, Festival of Literature in Dubai, she wanted to curl up, she says, uh, in bed and take a long winter's nap. <laughs> Not all, however, um, are so annoyed. On the contrary, there seems to be an increased interest, uh, in scholarly interest, interest in the question evidenced, for example, by the fact that uh, uh, two years ago, no, in 1999, uh, there was a fic uh, crime fiction in the Mediterranean conference in Nicosia, and also uh, the well-known um, literary journal, Egyptian journal Fusul, uh, dedicated a whole special issue to, the, uh, to crime fiction in the same year. These activities are somehow paralleled by the fact that the production um, of crime fiction in the Middle East seems to be steadily increasing uh, in recent years. And there is also an obvious demand outside uh, the region in the West for crime fiction from the Middle East. For example, uh, a German TV series just recently started some years ago Mordkommission uh, Istanbul <laughs> with uh, uh, German Turkish um, actors uh, with an inspector Mehmet Özakın and his beautiful wife Hülya and the assistant Mustafa Tobul. It's a <laughs> very nice uh, <laughs> thing every Saturday night. It's a very uh, important place in, in uh, German TV. Before I will approach the old question from another angle, let me just give you a brief overview um, over the types of crime fiction, or crime fiction in uh, brackets, in uh, uh, quotation marks, the types that are usually mentioned in the extremely few studies that have so, uh, so far been done on the matter uh, and de dealt with uh, crime fiction in the, in the Middle East. Of course, they go back to classical times <laughs> and try to find there the beginnings. Uh, one famous uh, quotation is uh, from The Thousand and One Nights, the story of the three apples, uh, where uh, we have uh, the dead body of a young woman. Uh, this dead body is found alongside the Tigris River, cut into pieces in a chest, uh, wrapped. Uh, and the caliph Harun al-Rashid orders his vizier Ja'far, uh, uh, the Barma kid, to find the one who's done it. Roger Allen, prominent uh, translator and uh, researcher in modern Arabic literature, calls this story a quintessential murder mystery of the whodunit type uh, with multiple 
plot twists. But in spite of the caliph's order, this Ja'far, the vizier, does absolutely nothing to investigate the, the case. He just sits at home and waits his own, uh, what, waits that something happens. So he risks being executed uh, because the caliph gave him a deadline of three days. Otherwise, you will, your head will be cut. And he's only saved by pure chance. Uh, uh, so there's actually, uh, actually no detective at all in this uh, story. And had this become the model of the modern Arabic detective, <laughs> it would be a bit uh, uh, surprising. There are uh, some crimes and more detective-like uh, figures in Adab literature, this uh, old prose type uh, literature. Um, I don't want to, to go into details here. The, there is the, the, uh, the clever judges um, who find out with some kind of tricks uh, who uh, is the thief or the murderer or so. And this uh, type of uh, literature is very close to another type about uninvited guests uh, and the ruses they, they, uh, they employ in order to get to the meal <laughs> or the uqala al-majanin type. Um, so there are some things. Uh, also, uh, we have similar uh, figures in the maqamat with this eloquent uh, trickster. And of course, in folk tradition, there's much, uh, many stories about murder and theft and uh, often also a magic detection of this. Um, some uh, very ambitious uh, researchers even go back to the Quran and the Surat Yusuf uh, and hold that this, the Holy Quran, is the essential model of the Arabic crime uh, story, and they say, <laughs> of course, we have there the story in the Yusuf, uh, in the Joseph uh, Surah, where they have to find out who has uh, done the, uh, the, what is called in English, um, who is the seducer and who is the victim. So there is one who says, okay, you have to look at the, at the kameez. Uh, if it is torn from behind, then it's uh, it's clear who it is, or it is torn from, from the backside. OK, and none of these uh, narratives, of course, mentioned uh, in classical literature uh, as possible early forerunners of the genre in medieval uh, literature resembles in character, however, those texts which uh, started to flow into the Arab world with the translation movement of the late 19th and <coughs> early 20th century. Translations were first made from, uh, from the French, later also from the English canon. Among the former, uh, we have this uh, Émile Gaboriau and Maurice Leblanc, uh, who were the first, uh, most uh, extensively translated. Among the latter, quite predictably, Arthur Conan Doyle and Agatha Christie. These translations uh, not only made Monsieur Lecoq and uh, Arsène Lupin, Sherlock Holmes and Miss Marple, known to a wider reading public. Um, uh, do I have this here? Let me see. Yeah, uh, it's even gone to, to Turkey, uh, where they try to imitate this uh, type uh, in the early Republic. And we have here an example of uh, the, the Istanbul, uh, Istanbulite Arsène Lupin, mm -hmm. The Adventures of Qadri, they never caught, I don't know, uh, would you translate it the same thing? Um, still written in, in Ottoman. So uh, it was very influential at that time. Um, the detective novel became very uh, popular uh, and um, this popularity has continued ever since, in a way. However, when the advo advocates of a national literature, we are in a period of nation building, now in the 20s, uh, 30s, 
and the advocates of a national literature started to create a genuinely Egyptian, genuinely Turkish, Lebanese, or whatever literature. Crime fiction in this period was ignored in their project, as were other subgenres. Uh, this lack of uh, prestige is probably partly to be seen as a reflection of the Western attitude towards uh, this kind of literature. At the same time, uh, it was certainly also an expression of the so-called pioneers' predominant interest in nation building. They had the description of the evils of society on their agenda, uh, but they were not particularly interested in crimes and in the few cases where they did make a crime a topic of a narrative, they did so within the discourse um, of social and or cultural criticism. There's, for instance, the famous, famous novel, novel by Tawfiq Hakim, The Maze of Justice in English, uh, where we have a case of murder, but this is only used as a metaphor. Um, if there's a public prosecutor uh, who's dealing with farmers in the countryside, and this crime remains unsolved over uh, the whole uh, uh, story. Um, and of course, it's a metaphor for saying that the modern European type jurisdiction is incompatible with the world of the Falahin. So the whole project of nation building, as it is, was envisaged by these pioneers, is called into question and very uh, pessimistic view. Um, this uh, situation um, and attitude towards uh, crime fiction prevailed also after the Second World War and for the, semen uh, for the remaining second half of the 20th century, uh, the recently. Uh, so uh, that is what we until now uh, or until very recently had were mostly uh, translations from and, uh, classics of Western crime fiction and thrillers. Um, if you do a, do a Google research, this is what uh, you got the most uh, hits for this type uh, of, of stories. All the European uh, uh, things we also know. Uh, and besides these, we have a number of texts in which crime, crimes feature as an important element without, however, being intended as pure entertainment. Crimes in these texts serve as a point of crystallization for other objectives um, or are functionalized in uh, other essentially philosophical, socially or politically critical discourses. For example, Nagib Mahfouz, uh, al Liswan Kilab, where we have uh, where the crime is used uh, or the the thief is used um, in a disc in a in a novel <laughs> which essentially deals with the, the with the Nasser time and the old ideals and what has come out of these old ideals uh, and uh, a former Robin Hood <laughs> thief meets uh, the new world, how it has uh, developed after a few years of Nasserism, and the climate has completely changed. Some people even mention Taib Saleh's Mosim al Hijra, the season of migration to the north. Although here we have a, a crime, of course, this Mustafa Said kills a British woman and seduces others uh, who commit suicide, many of them. Uh, and we have also other uh, um, uh, crimes in this novel, but to call this a crime novel, a crime fiction would be inappropriate because it's essentially on something else. It's an, on the problems of colonialism and how to deal in the new situation, to, to how to to uh, to tackle the the heritage that colonialism has left. Uh, and this bacillus of the virus of, uh, of violence, uh, as they, they call it in this text, uh, brought to the East by the colonizer, 
uh, and as uh, Tayyip Saleh says, that it affected also the Middle East itself inside uh, the, uh, the colonized, and now they have the, the, the wish to uh, revenge themselves against the former colonizer. Yet another example that is often quoted is Sunala Ibrahim's Lajna, the committee, where we have a real detective, <laughs> uh, the intellectual who tries to find out what's really going on in this country, in Egypt, of the Sadat era. But also here, the detective story and the crimes that are committed are political crimes, economical crimes uh, behind each, uh, every big crime is a big, uh, be, be, be behind every big uh, rich man is a big crime is the essential uh, sentence uh, in this. So also here, um, one would not call uh, this real crime fiction. So um, besides these texts, there has been until very recently, as I said, only very few texts that one would term crime fiction in the Mashriq at least, the, the, the Arab East. The Western part, North Africa, the Maghreb, seems to be different a bit because of the more intense colonization and the more the French influence we have there. Uh, people like uh, this uh, Yasmina Khadra, for example, quite some years ago he started um, his career. Um, therefore, it is not um, as it's quite typical to find observers of the literary scene, like the before mentioned Syrian novelist, um, state that with regard to the uh, in the book market in his country, there is no pure. Uh, Syrian detective story that would come to his mind. What this Ahmed Omar uh, says was somehow confirmed when I, on a research trip to Syria uh, earlier in uh, uh, 2011, before everything started there, uh, looked for riwayat policia, uh, crime fiction in the local book market. Uh, but in almost every bookshop in central Damascus uh, could not find anything except this one here. And there's plenty of it. It's Agatha Christie, the whole uh, thing, Agatha Christie in Arabic translation. And of course, some, some other classics, European classics. This is what the uh, what they first pointed to me when I insisted. Um, uh, some uh, of the staff brought me something which they said came close to indigenous crime fiction without, uh, be a, without being a translation. Moreover, the bookseller said that the author of the three-volume collection uh, of crime stories he recommended to me was extremely popular and the stories very well known. I bought the books and it turned out that I really hit a kind of mark. This um, um, based on true uh, cases from the archives of the criminal court uh, and police files, this Hukm al-Adala, thus ruled the court, had been the most popular radio and radio crime thriller uh, for over 30 years in, uh, in Syria, since 1977. The serial had um, even uh, had inter won international prizes, had even got a blog uh, of its own on the internet, and after the three-volume literarized version uh, of this radio uh, program, um, uh, which I'm going to talk about in the remaining minutes, had been published in 2007. Uh, it had even been turned into a TV program, Waj uh, al-Adala. Here are some actors. I'll show you some uh, pieces later. The three volumes um, contain 
48 stories of roughly equal length, 12 to 14 pages, pages each, which in most cases are themselves subdivided into three to five shorter sections with a subheading each. Uh, the stories bear quite appealing uh, titles. Here you have some of them in translation. Um, you would immediately like to, <laughs> to read one of these short uh, stories, I think. Um, <laughs> um, but um, uh, here are some others. Yeah. <laughs> um, the titles, however, in many cases, not only <laughs> give you or at least hint to the solution of the riddle, uh, which is usually exposed on the first <laughs> pages. Mm. Uh, by the way, this, uh, the way this is done reminds one, uh, if one reads a bit on the theory of crime fiction, it goes back, the, uh, the beginnings of European crime fiction were here in the this French uh, um, Pitaval, it's called, it, he was himself a lawyer like this Syrian um, uh, author who gave, who published famous interesting cases with the court decisions and if you look in the table of contents of uh, this Pitaval, which is 20 volumes but this is just an example, you have very similar uh, uh, sentences uh, announcing what is going on and attracting the reader, and it's even uh, has been studied that he has taken the most famous, the most attractive, most uh, bloody and uh, uh, morally um, questionable cases, which he liked. So, in a way, this uh, Munif does the same. In uh, uh, in some stories, also the the first paragraph anticipates, uh, like here in the number thirteen, um, one might even say precipitates <laughs> for a Western taste the solution. Uh, we have when Nabil took the receiver at his office and in the presence of his colleagues in order to phone his wife Hanan and tell her here above all the others that he had invited some friends for lunch at home today, he did not realize that in this moment he was committing a mistake that would turn out to be the evidence that would force him to confess what his hands had done. He's the murderer of his wife and rings her. So you know already from beginning what has happened and it's just uh, um, going back. In this way, uh, the focus very often is diverted from the question who's done it uh, to the way how and the reason why uh, she or he has done it uh, and how the crime was revealed uh, and the culprit was made to confess and more specifically to the details of these processes since we already have a clue about this in general from the title or from the first paragraph. This is very much in line uh, with the author's intentions as expressed in the preface to the volumes. His aim, al Yusufi writes there, has always been to shed light on society and its everyday life. The subtitle is Qisas Ijtima'iya, Stories from Society. Uh, hoping that an analysis of the types of crimes, of the types of crimes committed, as well as the culprit's background, motivation and behavior, would serve <coughs> beneficial end, ends. The stories, he says, should be read as warning examples. Ibar is the Arabic title, reminding of uh, moralistic uh, literature the study of which are meant to help to improve society. So he has clearly this civilizatory uh, mission. The task uh, the author here takes upon himself, a social reformer and the nation's teacher, 
is very much reminiscent of the one um, uh, taken by the 19th century um, men of enlightenment. And indeed, the publisher, who has a short foreword of his own in the collection, puts the author in a line with intellectuals from the Nahda time, this uh, uh, renaissance, so-called renaissance of the 19th century, who, in their efforts to implement social reform, followed a similar approach when they tried to instrumentalize entertaining popular narratives genres for their praiseworthy purposes. The publisher calls the collection a bridge between law and adab uh, and a cultural project that enhances society's ethics or morals and its juridical knowledge. So the publisher's likening uh, is certainly not too far-fetched like the patriarchal teacher narrators of the Nahda period. Uh, the narrator in this Hukm uh, al-Adala, in the three volumes, is a very powerful authority, and I think the whole thing has to do with uh, authority here, who has complete control over the narrative discourse. It is always he who is speaking, uh, he does not allow his characters to say anything themselves. There are no dialogues in this text. It's only descriptive. Neither, uh, uh, no, uh, also not in, in form of an interior dial uh, uh, monologue, for instance, or a free indirect style. It's also, uh, it's also him who guides the reader through the text, through the events, by deciding which detail uh, to be told first and which one next. Uh, and by rearranging the chronology of the events, by challenging the reader's questions into the direction of his, the narrator's choice, or even prescribing by way of authoritative comments, uh, or just graphically with the help of exclamation marks or question marks, what kind of emotional reaction the reader uh, should, um, uh, should show, which reaction should be appropriate in this case. I'm sorry. Uh, the teacher's attitude is also evident from the frequent interpolation of generalizing expressions, like, of course, it goes without saying, as is usual in such a situation, etc., uh, which, which show that the individual case has already been analyzed by the speaker himself, by the narrator, on a higher intellectual level, where it has been understood uh, as an example of a more general rule. So he's the, the intellectual who has reflected on this and can uh, give you the results of his uh, precious thoughts. Another uh, and only indirect but perhaps all the more impressive indication of the narrator's patriarchal power uh, are his occasional jokes and witty remarks uh, or his use within quotation marks of popular even dialectal expressions. With these the patriarch evidently is eager to um, to show that he's not only the cool, rational analyst and uncompromising moral judge that he may seem, but also a human being, and that he has still remained one of us. It's also important to connect to the readership, uh, whilst simultaneously uh, keeping the, the power, the authority. A man of the people, despite his elevated position as an educated intellectual. This seems to be all the more necessary since uh, the stories, unlike the radio program, are all written in modern standard Arabic. 
uh, which in itself implies a certain artificiality and a certain distance. In addition, uh, the role of the teacher guide taken, taken on by the author narrator and his declared aim of presenting uh, not only entertaining but also useful lessons that is something precious of a value obliges the reader to choose uh, an even more elevated linguistic register. The teacher guide's role and aims also seem to demand a more distant uh, distanced, mainly descriptive, report-like style that sticks to the spectrum of past tenses rather than to, the, to that of the present tense, which no doubt would have given the narrative a more immediate, more lively character. And they seem to demand also that the author should refrain from showing too much personal and emotional involvement himself, this would be rather unseemly uh, and not becoming for a moral authority like him. Something which combines with the fact that the author narrator indeed uh, does not form part of the narrower circle of those involved in the crime and its detection. In most of the stories, uh, he's actually an outsider who happens to have access to the court files and also and only therefore is able to retell uh, in retrospection what he has read. And this, in a way, is the perspective of the strong winner who has already gained control over uh, a disturbance of the existing order. The only way for this kind type of narrator um, to produce the kind of suspense, tashwiq, as it's called in Arabic, uh, uh, which many praise in his uh, stories, um, is to hold back some of the details uh, of uh, after having already attracted initial attention, like the uh, by the uh, headings or the first uh, paragraphs, the appetizing titles. In this way, the whole project of what he uh, what this uh, lawyer does. Uh, of a literarization, uh, or to put it perhaps more adequately, of adabization, <laughs> I like this uh, word of adaptation, is an attempt to make the crime plots conform to the very old traditional ideals of adab, and to make the narrative meet in this way the stipulations of a more normative ethics and aesthetics. The effect I have to confess is rather shallow and for me hardly more charming uh, than the few very old-fashioned and also a bit prudish illustrations uh, that accompany some of the stories. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is in striking uh, contrast to the radio program, which makes professional use of music, um, dispenses with any kind of narrator, and in letting speak exclusively those who are involved, really re-enacts the crime and its uh, detection. And it does so with most of the texts spoken in the people's natural language in the Syrian uh, dialect, and I hope it works to give you an example of how these start. Brukno. <laughs> So if we go, go in, this is... 
very lively, uh, completely different from, from the written texts. Uh, with music, and or we can take an example of the... Oh, sorry. No. Or an example of the filmatization for the for the TV. Some of the are still on. Is it this? Look there. Very. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, that has changed in between. I <laughs> thought it was. I oh, know it is. Mm. This is the type of crime fiction as we know it, of course. Uh, it's not mm. It starts with a dead the, the corpse. So the, with the high position, they are closer to Fusha, but the low people, of course, they speak uh, uh, any kind of dialect as we go in here, for example. So So there is no narrator here who could influence or show what is uh, uh, yeah, I think I stop here. You got an, uh, an idea of how it looks like. Um, yeah, that's we have uh, have to conclude. Um, we have uh, a strange coexistence. Uh, of two or even three uh, realizations of the same material uh, in different genres. While it is probably beyond dispute that all fulfill uh, an affirmative value, conservative, I think it's still available on the websites now uh, after the events, um, a very conservative, affirmative uh, function that in a way helps to cement existing social and moral norms, also political system maybe, and to perpetuate the established order. It is also ob obvious that the idea of what literature uh, is or should be, namely adab, seems to be responsible for producing narratives that do in no way fulfill Western expectations of what crime fiction can or should be. It is only in very recent years that, uh, that um, so it's genre constraints which I think are responsible for this uh, perceived lack or previous lack of. Uh, thing. And with this, because the language is so strong uh, and has this uh, kind of um, authority, it's only in recent years where these authorities uh, seem to collapse that we uh, witness a new increase of this uh, genre. And uh, there are just some, some texts which popped up uh, um, here, some of them, uh, very few owned already from the 80s, but most of them from the 90s. and. Uh, the closer we get to 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 our days, uh, the more we get. So uh, there are a number of titles uh, which I would have liked to to read with some students in my course on contemporary <laughs> uh, literature. 
to look at what it is. So we have documentary novels. We have a kind of we have kind of thrillers. We have love stories, uh, um, more uh, thriller-like, bloody things. Uh, it just comes out. Uh, uh, here are some some others. Maybe you have heard already f about this utopia, very bloody uh, thing. And uh, but even in Saudi Arabia, we have the production of crime fiction uh, out of a sudden somehow. Uh, and one of the most famous is perhaps this uh, Vertigo, which, by the way, is an example of autofiction <laughs> also, uh, because uh, it's uh, very easy to, to find out that it's the author himself who is writing it. There are so many uh, uh, correspondences. Yeah, that's it. <laughs>